quick housekeeping note. Um, Scott Armstrong informs me that copies of his paper uh, may be passed out here if we can find them, but you'll, you, you can get copies of his paper today. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I've spent 55 years so far working in forecasting research and forecasting problems. This is my favorite one so far. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick overview of some of the um, work we've done on global warming forecasting. And then I'm going to bring in uh, two or three things that have been published uh, in the last month. The clicker is here. Uh, I got into evidence-based forecasting. Uh, you know, under what conditions should uh, we use which methods? You know, we have a certain situation. What methods should we use? So, and, and there's a lot of experimental evidence on this. Uh, and I gathered this by asking uh, people around the world, 40 experts in different disciplines, uh, with 120 different reviewers, and we summarized what they had to say. So they came up with 140 principles. It's free, available on the checklist. If you just put in uh, the forecasting audit on the uh, Google search, that's the first thing that comes up. The book costs something, but the checklist is free. They apply to all areas of forecasting. Now, the problem we have is uh, when I, not just global warming, but almost any work I do is everybody thinks their situation is different. You know, principles don't apply here. I mean, some of these principles are just basic scientific principles like providing full disclosure. <laughs> all areas, I repeat that. And to my knowledge, there's no other summary. Nobody's published a summary of forecasting principles. This is it. I've been asking for years. There's a three-legged stool for climate policy, and we need uh, scientific forecast for each of the three areas. We have to know that there's going to be substantive long-term trend in global mean temperatures, that harmful effects will result from this, and that uh, there's a net benefit if we take some action. So without all three of those, there's no reason for policy. So how many of those stools, legs do we have? Well, the uh, IPCC, on well, the internal part of the report, they say uh, it's impossible to make uh, long-term future forecasts. Uh, and after looking at this, I found uh, there are no scientific forecasts to support any of the three legs. What they do instead of forecasting is they use scenarios. It was considered as a method, uh, um, but it's been tested out and it's not a valid method. So what scenarios are, they're stories about what happened in the future. Uh, they are biased, so you decide uh, what story you would like. They turn out to be very persuasive. Uh, the Highlighted there, things there are uh, uh, things you can click through. Uh, we have on the uh, printed version of this, which you will get, we have the website you can go and uh, go to this talk, and you can open that and get all these references. They're based on expert judgments. Um, expert judgments about what will happen in complex, uncertain information, situations compared to what non-experts can do. Experts are useless. It's hard to accept that. That's one of the most well-founded uh, things we've found in the, you know, the last half century of research. In um, about 40 years ago, I summarized the, uh, an article, the research, and I called it the seersucker theory. No matter how many, uh, you know, how much, how, how little evidence there is that experts are able to forecast, uh, suckers will find, will pay seers for the forecast. <laughs> Uh, Tetlock comes up with a 20-year experiment to show the same thing. Beautiful study. Um, now, of course, that doesn't apply to us. That applies to other people. Everybody thinks that they're exempt from that. Application of the global audit, it takes a little bit of knowledge. You'd have to read up a little bit to do it, so it's not for the non-experts. Um, so, uh, Kessing Green and I did a, an audit of the IPCC forecast, the wings that they use with their business as usual, and we found that they violated 72 of the 89 relevant forecasting principles. Things like compare reasonable methods or 
provide full disclosure. Now, how many of you work in a job where you're allowed to violate uh, key principles? How many engineers would get away with that? How, ma how many doctors? I worked also in a policy area. It was uh, forecasting uh, the uh, need to protect polar bears. And uh, there were two government-sponsored papers that forecasted global polar bear populations. 46% of the principles on average were violated. 23% were apparently violated. Uh, and here's one of them. You know, you want to avoid bias. Well, here's the title of the report that they're working on. The title was USGS Science Strategy to Support U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. You know, if you give me enough data and you tell me what you want, I can show you anything. So make sure that the forecasts are independent of politics. Now, uh, when this thing came up, uh, Jim Inhofe was uh, heading up that, uh, not, he was on that committee. It was uh, that lady from California that was heading up. Uh, and uh, she kept calling me uh, Dr. Scott, the marketing professor. Uh, there, you know, there would have been a decline in uh, polar bears. Suddenly the government found there was going to be an, an amazing increase in polar bears. And I offered to bet Barbara Boxer that there wouldn't be. Uh, she didn't reply, but I think I'm way ahead now. Uh, since 2008, uh, I think polar bear population is up. Golden rule of forecast. This is our newest one. Uh, golden rule of forecasting is to be conservative. What we mean by be conservative is to adhere to cumulative knowledge. Incidentally, the alternative title for that is forecast unto others as you would have them forecast unto you. <laughs> cumulative knowledge represent knowledge about the situation. I have Willie Soon to back me up on that stuff. Uh, and it means knowledge about evidence-based methods. A uh, paper just came out this month, The Golden Rule of Forecasting. So we applied that to, um, well, when, when should you be conservative, first of all? And uh, basically, it applies to any problem, especially when the situation is complex, when it's uncertain, and when it's prone to bias, such as uh, public mass transit proposals. You know, on average around the world, they forecast twice as many people will use the uh, transit as actually happens, and they forecast half the costs. So. Uh, golden rule of forecasting checklist. Now here we have a checklist that can be used by typical people, clients. And by logic, we developed 28 guidelines to be conservative. And you'll have copies of that uh, that you can uh, access. It's also on, a sh on the sheet in the, in the uh, tote bag. So we, then we went back and we said, well, how many forecasting papers have we found where people have compared uh, uh, problems and we can look at whether they were conservative or not. And it was amazing. We found um, 109 papers that allowed us to test out this hypothesis. Uh, the use of a typical guideline, uh, oh, and, and they were always consistent with this, and the typical guideline, um, it reduced the forecast error by 31%. Uh, applied to IPCC scenarios. Uh, again, we used the uh, IPCC, and uh, Kesten Green and I did the checklist. 20 of the guidelines were relevant to forecasting climate change. So how many were followed by the IPCC, and how many were followed by, uh, oh, none, there it is. Uh, our, no, our no change model follows 95%. Does this make any difference? Well, look what happens. Uh, oh, incidentally, you don't have to trust us. This is so simple, you can do it yourself. It took Kess and I each 15 minutes. It might take you a little bit longer because you didn't make up the checklist. So. Uh, test of forecasting accuracy over the 1851-1975 period found that uh, for long-term forecast, there were 58 forecasts for horizons 95 to 100 years ahead. Um, the no change forecast is really accurate. If you go 50 years out, the average, uh, average error, mean absolute error is uh, 24%, 0.24 degrees centigrade. Estimates of the IPCC model had forecast errors that were 12.6 times larger than the no change forecast. And our model is really cheap. 
Simple forecast. This is the other paper that we're pretty excited about that just came out this month. Uh, simplicity requires that reasonably intelligent clients can understand the method that's being used, the uh, representation of human of knowledge, and the relationship in the models, and the relationships between the models and the forecasts and decisions. So we're asking normal people to look at this thing, do they understand what's going on? We reviewed this by going to prior research and founding uh, ways that we could uh, look at that prior research, and we found 32 papers and 97 comparisons. Uh, none of the papers found complexity helps. This has been going on for half a century among academics. That's the way you get ahead in academics is write complex papers. And it harms accuracy. It harms understanding. Complexity increases forecast error by 27% across papers. Out this month. Okay, when the, we then looked at the IPCC projections versus no change. On average, the compliance with the, uh, how many of the um, 20 things do they comply with? IPCC uh, complies with 19% 19, 19 of them. Uh, the no change forecast complies with 96%. So the IPCC is really complex. Again, you, you can make your own ratings. This is even easier than the golden rule. And again, remember, here are the results that we just referred to above. We, we took different time periods. This is in the, uh, the, the uh, new book that just came out um, by Alan Moran. Uh, different time periods, uh, we tested three hypotheses. It's warming, it's cooling, or there's no change. Cooling is a much more accurate hypothesis than warming, as you can see in each of the uh, three uh, steps. I'm not going to dwell on this. It takes too long. You'll have the chart. You can look at it. Why are complex used by the global warming alarmists? Uh, they impress people, uh, especially when they're used by people who appear to be experts. Incidentally, they found out it doesn't work for students, uh, but it does work for experts. Uh, complex methods allow clients to get the result they want. Analysis of previous environmental, we wonder, where's this whole thing going? You know, have there been anything like this in the past? Uh, so we found 20, we found analogies. People sent them all around the world, they sent us analogies. There were 71 of them. 26% met our criteria that made it similar to what we have here in global warming. None of the 26 alarms were based on uh, any scientific forecasting. None of the alarms were accurate. The government took action in 23 of the 26 cases. They were harmful in 20, and three, it's uncertain. So we got a tough road ahead. There's going to be a lot more damage done before this is done. Uh, so we predict the uh, movement will eventually fail, as all the others had, but it's going to be a lot of harm along the way. Uh, policy should be based on scientific forecasts. To date, none are. No one's challenged our finding that the, uh, about the invalidity of the IPCC forecast. Um, nor has anyone challenged, in the Armstrong, uh, Green, Armstrong, and Soon is the only paper that says these are fine scientific forecasts of global warming. Nobody else, is, of climate change, nobody else has done that. It'd be nice if a lot of you would refer to these studies, so we keep repeating this. Uh, uh, now, the Willie Soon affair, that was one of those studies that was uh, in the New York Times, and that's our, my reply to Willie Soon's, uh, the Willie Soon affair. The single hypothesis approach, the advocacy approach, is inconsistent with the scientific method. So we urge other researchers to uh, test, replicate what we've done, test alternative hypotheses, and, and a plea, let's see. Repetition, I, I wrote a book on uh, persuasion. Repetition is good for persuasion. Uh, especially when people don't care much about the topic. So we, the, got, the mass media keeps blaring this thing, and it's very convincing to people. It's going to fail as th this becomes a more high involvement situation. Uh, it also is going to fail because repeating lies, it turns, repeating helps, you can repeat lies, but only if people aren't interested. Once they get interested, then repeating lies harms them. 
So repeating the truth helps. So we'd appreciate it if you keep repeating this message. There's only one scientific forecast uh, and that uh, we should, uh, they have no defense for that. The, well, they do. That's back to the Willie Soon affair. They can say we are incompetent and we're, we're biased and so forth. So that's it. Thank you.